wanted to start off by just saying you have eloquently and consistently argued that you are not anti-Semitic in any fashion. Why do you think accusations of anti-Semitism have dogged you? Um, well, on, on the Palestinian issue, um, there's only one side to the conversation. And people are always saying, you know, it's so complex. No, it's not. It's really, really simple. It's a simple question of whether or not we believe in human rights. And I do, and the Israeli government doesn't. Mm -hmm. So um, they can't have that conversation because there's only one right side to that conversation. There really is only one right side. And, and so they can't have the conversation. So the alternative to having the conversation is to do the invasion of the body snatches. You know, mm -hmm. he's an anti-Semite. No, I'm not. And neither, neither are all my friends in BDS. None of them are anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Do you suspect is that because you're such an ardent supporter of B BDS, that that's the evidence or part of the example that they, they give for your anti-Semitism? Well, well, yeah, there's this, it's been this whole thing recently with the um, IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, I believe, definition which now includes any criticism of the Israeli government policies mm -hmm. as a hate crime, as anti which is completely nonsensical, as we know. But um, it, there it is. However, the fact that um, s they, somebody, somebody that actually has no real power to define what words mean, they're not lexicographers. They're, this isn't. They're not writing a new dictionary. They're not Samuel Johnson. They're just interested in uh, propaganda to support that state. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, the next few years are going to be really interesting, and hopefully, won't lead to a global conflagration. Mm -hmm. that will kill us all, because it, it could happen. Yeah. If I'm correct, you just turned 76? I did. Right. And one of the things I, I have to say that Jim and I are <coughs> awed by the, the location. We, we, we are humbled by the, the location, which is so fantastic. And obviously, you're a world-renowned uh, musician. Why do you put yourself through this uh, world of, of political activism? when it's so contentious. I mean, you could kick back, you could relax, you could enjoy the scenery here in the Hamptons. So <clears throat> what compels you to do it? Um, well, I, I, I don't have a choice, really. I think we are saddled or blessed with uh, the genes that we get from our parents. My parents were both very committed politically to all kinds of causes. Mm -hmm. My father through his fairly short life and my mother through her fairly long life. Um, you know, my mum used to say to me, uh, and I've said this before in interviews or I've written it, she, she said to me, you know, Roger, there's, whenever a question arises about what you should or shouldn't do on any issue, really, there's nearly always a right thing to do. You just have to figure out what it is and then do it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the end of it. So the right thing, for instance, tomorrow I'm going to Harold Square. There's something I don't, this is completely new for me because the uh, climate change lobby <coughs> and, and also the anti-war lobby are combining. It's a joint march to the UN because it's UN um, General Assembly week in New York City. So I'm going to go there and stand on the stage and have my three minutes of, you know, mm -hmm. saying whatever pops into my mind. But, um, and that, this is new for me. Like last week I was in London and I, I sang Wish You Were Here. I saw it. Okay, well. That was fantastic. And, and I stood on the stage with the wonderful John Pilger and we had dinner later, and so there was a bit of drinking and hugging, which I adore, which was fantastic. I've known him off and on 
since my Radio Chaos tour, when I used a lot of the film he made with David Munro that was called The Four Horsemen, which was, which was specifically a documentary pointing out that the arms industry starts and fuels and maintains the state of war because that's how they make their money. And, um, and it, it was true then and it's even truer now. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm going back on the road next year. I've decided to do dates in the United States and Canada, and I've just added three dates in Mexico City because I love Mexico and I love Mexico City. Uh, yeah. And I thought long and hard before committing to going back on the road. It means making a new show. But I think next year is hugely yeah. important. Jim and I were talking on the way as, as I sent you my email. When I'm not teaching, Jim and I filmed for the last 18 months on the border. And uh, we've gone, you know, really from San Diego through, through Big Ben. And I, I've talked to asylum seekers and kids in, in cages. And I was in El Paso when they dropped off a, a thousand refugees and they just went to all these different hotels. And I shouted a doctor there, a fantastic guy by the name of Dr. Carlos Gutierrez, and he, he gives all this medical uh, attention. And we were thinking, it would be great if you, you had a, a concert right at the wall. And well, well, it's funny you should say that because the mayor of Juarez has wrote to me recently to, and said, Can we, will you come and do a concert in Juarez? So I may well be able to do that. It's a, it's, it's a question of um, a free concert. This would be a free mm -hmm. concert. So. Mm -hmm free for the people there's no such thing as a free lunch as we all know but right somebody has to, somebody has to pay for it there's if i go and do a concert it's a big crew and it's a big this and that and the sure, other and, absolutely um whatever so i'm really hoping to do that you know probably my favorite gig over the in the last 10 years was when we played in zocalo zocalo square mm -hmm. in mexico city free mm -hmm. so we had like 300,000 300,000 something like that spreading out into all yeah. the streets we were playing in front of the presidential palace yeah. I made a speech to him he's gone now thank goodness mm -hmm. we've got a somewhat more progressive um, president in Mexico so hopefully they'll make some strides uh, in the right direction <clears throat> I don't know I, I think the the wall is is this incredible backdrop for your, you know, particular concert, you know, on, on both sides of the border as a unifier would just be absolutely fantastic. I mean, one of the things we're doing is, is just looking at this physical construct of a border, yeah. but also the border or the wall in the imagination of people. I mean, what, the, what does it mean to Mexicans? What does it mean to the, to the Americans uh, there? What kind of shared? It's almost like a hybridity when, when people are right there in the border. <coughs> I thought that would just be such a fantastic, Roger Waters brings uh, both sides, uh, you know, together at, at the, the wall. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. So. Well, you may, you, may, you may be right. Yeah. I mean, it's a sort of simple concept. The biggest wall within the context of this conversation we're having about that part of the geography of the globe is the wall, in my view, is the wall between the citizens of the United States of America and the reality of their past and who they are mm -hmm. and what this country is and what it represents and whatever because they are infected by the, the propaganda machine that tells them what it is and we know that what the propaganda machine tells them is not what it is mm -hmm. you know absolutely uh, you know this is not a benign benevolent freedom loving place it is the absolute bastion of everything that is evil about the human race as well. I mean, I'm not picking the United States out particularly, except that it's so powerful and spends so much money on its military and wants to rule the world in like, like a old, old kind of imperial power. Right. They want to be the Roman Empire. Right. And um, to some large extent, they're succeeding. But, in, but a consequence of their success is they are destroying everything destroying this planet mm -hmm. destroying all of this 
And I'm not saying that because this is just picturesque and beautiful, and but because it's the same, you know, everywhere. Wow. My missus yesterday was she 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 keeps carnivorous plants down there by this pool, and yesterday there was a praying mantis about that big sitting on one of them, and we sat and transfixed and watched the incredible beauty of a hornet thinking about going into one of them to its death, and what, and, and then and the the praying mantis actually saw it, and then it, we. So it was, it was like watching David Attenborough, but it was like, it's in the back garden. I mean, all of this is so exquisitely beautiful that to, to rush headlong into just killing everything seems to be hugely counterproductive. But, sadly, IQ in species doesn't seem to be um, a qualifying factor that helps species to survive. I mean, Homo sapiens. Are, we have, we have a lot of a lot of intelligence, but we don't seem to be able to connect it to our capacity for love and mm. empathy, in order to say, "Hang on a minute, we live. This is where we live. This is this is as far as we know. This is all we've got. No, we're not going to. Whatever Elon Musk may say, we're not going to go and colonize Mars. And why would we want to? Mm -hmm. We can figure out how to live here." Mm -hmm. But we do have to act collectively and we have to act out of compassion for one another and accept we're all brothers and sisters and blah, blah, blah. We can't make it a neo-liberal, you know, Keynesian economic free-for-all where the weakest get trampled on or killed mm -hmm. and the strongest get richer and richer and richer until they don't know which Gulf Stream to get into that morning to fly to breakfast or wherever it, whatever it is that they're doing. I know you know all this, but most of the people who live here in the United States, they have no idea. They have no idea. Well, if I could just share a, a couple of things. I interviewed a sheriff, very cool. His name is Tony Estrada, and he was born in Nogales, Mexico, but he's a fantastic sheriff, and I got attracted to watching him on documentaries because he was so humane. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that he, he said that just resonated with me, he said the United States creates the drug cartels. Uh, he said the United States took their eye off of, of Mexico. I interviewed a guy that started some of those militia on the, <coughs> on the border, Jim Gilchrist, and I went to his house. Jim was with me not too long ago. And he, he was talking about this kind of, I don't know, European white identity. And, and I said, you know, I don't think that, that it exists, what you're referring to. And I said, do you know that the United States had a coup in 1954 in Guatemala and, and overthrew a democratically elected government in El Salvador and Honduras and, Nick, you know, and all this? And he saw John, he says, I, I, I didn't know that. So this is like the, this kind of... This is your sheriff. He, well, he was, this was Jim Gilchrist. He, uh. he was the, the, the guy that was the, part of the border militia. But what, what I was telling him, is that, <clears throat> and, and he kind of just came clean. He was very sad. He said, oh, John, I, I didn't really know that. He says, you look at all the, the shit that the, the United States creates that Americans don't know about. So he says, like, there's a demographic crisis where people are coming from Central America. Do you know why they're coming from Central America? Um, because the United States imposed dictatorships on them. Exactly. And then, the, you know, the, the same thing in other <coughs> places where there, there's a, a fight over, over the narrative. I mean, the sheriff, Tony Estrada, says, we took our eye off a very friendly neighbor in Mexico, and we spent all our time in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we, we just didn't, weren't paying attention. But I think the point is, is when, when people are ignorant and all they do is they talk about all these refugees or these migrants coming with very little understanding how the United States was in, involved in, in bringing this about. And, and it's a contest for the narrative, which I think leads me also to, you know, the, I think the narrative on, on, on Israel uh, that, that just drives me in, insane. It's very difficult to, to teach Israel and Palestine without worrying the same thing that someone labels you, an, you know, an anti-Semite. But, you know, the, these questions that you hear like from Mark Regev, does Israel not have the right to defend itself? And without any other investigation, people say, oh, wow, that, that seems very, very logical. Or, you know, in 2005, <clears throat> uh, that Israel left Gaza? I said, okay, fair enough. Who controls the water? 
Uh, who controls the air? Hello. Who controls the fish? There's a guy by the name of Dov Weisskas who controlled the calories of, of the people that are actually living in Gaza. I asked Chomsky about this, and he said, is, is this, you know, I've, I've heard this, and, he, and you know, he confirmed it. And, and so w with people very superficial and not really doing their work, said, well, Jesus, I don't know, it sounds fair enough. Israel got up and, and, and they left Gaza. And that, they're left, when people come up with, in my opinion, wonderful conclusions, good conclusions, to the false information that they have. It's, it seems quite, quite logical. And there's a, a constant you know, fighting for this. I wanted to, to ask you, uh, because I, I know that you have a, another engagement, but just try to bring this together. Mm. When you went to the, the West Bank, mm -hmm. I remember you saying, looking at the plight of the Palestinian people, mm -hmm. it brought tears to your eyes and I think one of the things that is like a segue, I don't understand, why is it about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that it's almost like evidence, you bring evidence to people and they'll still come up with some other creative reason to say, you know, it's not an occupation or uh, Israeli soldiers are the most humane in the, in the world. <laughs> what, what, what did you find? What was your experience when you went to the West Bank? All right, so this is 2006 we're talking about, or 2007 when I went all over with Allegra Pachea and uh, under the protection of the UN, which, which immediately made us sort of suspect. So it may be the cruel, callous disdain with which I was treated by all those young Israeli kids who man all the border posts and the checkpoints and the things. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, my God, if they're treating me like this, a, a, an English national foreigner checking stuff out, imagine how they are treating the people who they're occupying and who are a subjugated second class. Or, or they're treated as if they are not human. The Palestinians are treated like animals. And even some of the the politicians. I mean, if you listen to Eilat Shaka or or any of them, actually, sometimes you know it, it slips out all the time that that's that's how they think of them. So <clears throat> it's an experiment that went hideously and horribly wrong. Obviously, during and after the First World War and. Sykes-Picot and the divvying up of all the stuff in the Middle East was insane after the First World War. That was, that was a real opportunity then to say, let's have a look at this thing. And we, are, we now have some power because we've just fought a war against the Turks and the Germans and we seem to have won it. So, we, so let's figure out how to... And they didn't. They went, let's divvy up this cake and fucking eat it. And that's what the Brits did after the First World War, mm -hmm. you know, and people are always talking about the Balfour Declaration, which, is, which actually was just one letter to Edmund Rothschild saying this government looks favorably beyond the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. But they didn't want Jews in and, England. And, yeah, clearly, but, and, or maybe, and, but the, but the sentence that follows that is so long as it in no way impacts on the civil or human rights of the indigenous people of that land, mm -hmm. the people who are living there, so long as it doesn't impact in any way on their freedoms. Mm -hmm. and that's a bit of the Balfour letter that is rarely read out in public because mm -hmm. it's an inconvenient truth for the Israeli government. And so there's this What's, what's interesting is that this is only 70 years old. It's not like talking about the colonization of North America and the genocide of the Native American people who, who were living here and South America, mm -hmm. North and South America, by the English and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the French and whoever else wanted to, a piece of it. But this is happening now. So this is settler colonialism, rampant, based upon um, religious and white supremacist um, ideas 
of how human beings differ one from another. Mm -hmm. So and 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 so they've created this apartheid state, which people now recognise that's what it is. Richard Falk and others have written extensively on this sure. thing. So we, we now we know what the reality is, but. Um, I don't know. It's hard. It's it's it. It's hard to predict what may happen in the future. But I do know this: the movement of which I'm a part, a small part, the BDS movement, is growing, mm -hmm. hand of a fist. Which is why they're becoming more and more desperate in their attempts to criminalise it. Well, they, they try to shut down a, a conference with such jolly, right? You were part of, and there was. Uh, perhaps a, a lawsuit taking place and oh, I well, well that was at Amherst, that right, was at yes, UMass, Am right. Amherst, yeah, but that, that never really got yeah. off the ground, it went before a local judge, you just went, are you crazy? Yeah, I remember you saying you wished it had gone, <laughs> it had gone a bit further, it might have been more beneficial. Well, I, I wish that when, when um, you know, Cuomo wrote, an ex by executive order, he wrote into the uh, New York uh, state legislature that no state organization could do business with anyone who had anything to do with BDS. Mm -hmm. And in consequence, they tried to stop me playing right. in the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Yeah. I was praying that they would push that right. so, so I could have my day in court yes. and argue the case yeah. for freedom of speech and the First Amendment right. and all the rest of it. With respect, I want to go back just a little bit to yeah. West Bank, yeah. um, Janine and the, the Jordan, all the places you, you went. I always like to talk to people that have their, what I call the boots on the ground. You know, I, I filmed in, in the West Bank. I, I live with Palestinian students, um, been in, in places. And I remember somebody in, in, in the Hasbro project said, in, in the war of words, Israel wins. In, in the war of, of pictures and images, we lose. And, and I think that's very important when you try to share me as a, as a teacher and you as an activist, the, the things that you saw in the West Bank that you think people need to, to know about. I had a meeting with one of the elders in Janine. I can't remember his name. He was an eloquent man, taciturn, but, and, but eloquent and obviously he spoke Arabic and so on, I don't, so we had a translator and he told me that, he told me one thing that I've never forgotten and it was this, he said, the children in this refugee camp in, in Janine, they were there when the Israeli tanks came in and bulldozed everything and blah blah in 2002 or whenever it was, 2001 or whatever, and, and he said, um, They've grown up a bit. They're a few years older now, and they they are now committing suicide mm -hmm. because they're so damaged by mm -hmm. their experiences as young children. And he said, and this is how they commit suicide: they take a kitchen knife and walk towards a checkpoint and get shot to death. Mm -hmm. They know they're not going to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. They're committing suicide, and that. I remember when he told me that, this old bloke, um, well I'm tearing up a little bit now because you think, oh my god, the, des the desperation, you know. Actually in my movie I've, I've shot somebody picking up a pair of scissors and going out to be killed, mm -hmm. uh, a girl. Um, we, we, there's no way that any of us can possibly imagine what it must be like. To, to live under the heel of the jackboot like mm -hmm. they do and have done and they do and they have done for generation after generation after since 1947 yeah it's been the same so you can't be there and not feel the agony of of it mm. and the wrong of it it's so wrong it's right. just desperately uh, I, wrong i filmed everywhere we'd go by you know, checkpoints and people said to Palestine, John, you shouldn't f fucking film it. Um, refugee camp. I have a lovely picture. I'm just very happy. I was in a refugee camp and one of the things that, that hit me in Ramallah, 
the, the kids were playing on dirt, kicking a soccer ball uh, uh, about, and I said to this dad, I'm not being patronizing, I said, can I buy your kids a big chocolate, I mean, the big chocolate bars? There's a little place out there, and he said, yeah. And the kids all, all wind up there, um, people begging me to come into their house. They talk about, there's a big picture of a, a woman uh, and, and, and a son up there. And my, my son was taken out of here in the middle of the night. He, he you know, he's gone. Flying chickens everywhere, and in, in, in this, and then they you know, see where the camera. The next house, please, please come, come in, and we, we want to tell you the, you know, the the story. I remember waiting to go into Jerusalem. I was telling people, would you have Palestinians trying to work in Jerusalem? Are lined up at three o'clock in the morning, and they're getting their cups of tea, and they're getting you know whatever they can for the eight o'clock shift. Here I come, U.S. citizen, you know, right through, you know, and off you, off you go. Um, seeing, I was telling uh, Jim a little bit earlier, Palestinian students would be way out to beyond. I think this was Temptation of Christ was out there. You know, <laughs> he was just way, way out here. And a van, and I said, John, um, he said, undo the window. He said, undo the window and the smell of raw human sewage. Like, Jesus Christ, what's going on? There's an Israeli settlement right above. And I, mean, I got really good at, you know, you, you see that red brick, you, you see that it, it's up on the, on the mountaintop, you know, for logistical reasons, the big swimming pools, everything out there. And this guy was explaining, says, once the, raw, the tanks fill up for the Israelis, they just let it loose on, on top of the Palestinians. And uh, one of my students was Palestinian, I met her there, and it wasn't, wasn't planned. I couldn't, you know, kind of post it, I'm, I'm off to Palestine or something, and she, and she was there. She said, we're really embarrassed that we, we burn our trash on the, on the side of the road. We have nothing. And uh, water, with a, the water comes once a week. So the Israelis are stealing Palestinian water and then charging the Palestinians for the, for the water while well, you have these lush swimming pools all on the, the settlers. And, and then the other violation of international law everywhere, separating Palestinians in the West Bank and, and, and Gaza or collective punishment. Uh, it just all, all these things that are happening and just think what uh, as I said I'm at a point in my life and like wasting time I, I guess it's not I saw Chomsky giving um, a, a lecture to some maybe it was a graduation thing um, at some university somewhere up in New England I'm not quite sure where and um, he did this he did this great thing where he he said to these young kids um, there's something that we could do um, which would solve almost all the problems that there are anywhere in the world. We could obey the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our law. No. The United States, the law of the land in the United yeah. States. If we did that, almost all of these problems would go away. Because yeah. there wouldn't be any... Of course, we don't obey the law. Sure. It's law lawlessness prevails. I'm such a believer in the rule of law. The law. In in my in a I wrote an opera um, about the French Revolution. Well I didn't write the original libretto, that was written by a Frenchman called Etienne Rodagil, who's sadly dead now. But I added to it considerably and when I wrote a translation and then I added to it. And there's one bit in it that goes um, tears like falling rain uh, slake the thirst and ease the pain and, cru and cooling in the crucible an idea forms a nugget of belief in the hearts of the poor that maybe in the dawn's new light they have a right to the law mm. the idea that poor people have a right to the law it's not just a manifestation of the rich man's need to protect himself from scoundrels and terrorists and vagabonds. Yeah. And Chomsky said in the interview I did with him, and it resonated with me, Chomsky said that there are many intractable conflicts all over the world. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not one of them. He said we, there has been a very, very sustainable possible peace plan for, for 50 years. Uh, but but it is it's not implemented, and uh, that just kind of resonates with me. But obviously, you've noticed a great change in, in BDS and, and the success and, and the change of young voices today. 
uh, that are talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I watched a video where you said things are rapidly changing. I think you were on Democracy Now! Uh, mm -hmm. when somebody asked you about how, how the movement is. Well, that's how, how is the movement, the BDS movement, progressing? Well, I, I judge it on the basis of how hard they try to kill us. And they're trying really hard to silence all the voices, to criminalize. And it's, and it's not just in the United States or in Israel, it's all over Europe as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, w I was touring in Germany last year, and I was staggered by the mindfuck that's going on with the whole of the German people. Though it's not the German people, it's, it's, it's the Bundestag, it's, it's the parliament, and it's the political leaders. They are bowing down to the will of the Israeli lobby. Mm -hmm. The people actually are not really buying it. Although they still suffer from the kind of mass guilt about the Second World War and about the Holocaust and blah blah, and in consequence find it very difficult to s even speak about Israel and Palestine. They, mm. see, they, can't, they find it very, very difficult. But, but actually with all the um, polls that have been done, a majority of the German people think the Palestinians are being really badly treated and that something should be done about it, and that the German government should censure um, the Israeli government. I was interested to see that yesterday a trade union contract uh, congress in in England, which represents not that many people anymore, because he, in England, like everywhere else, the unions have been slowly whittled down and brought to heel and whatever. But mm -hmm. it's about six million people they represent. They passed a resolution that w that the UK should not sell arms to Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a significant move. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things that, uh, that has been really m makes my heart beat harder and makes me feel really good is how the Jewish community and the community that's not Jewish have come together and recognizing their common humanity. So J J JVP and, mm -hmm. and, and all the other Jewish movements that are fighting harder than anybody else, really, in, uh, in order to uh, um, bring human rights to the Palestinians, mm -hmm. and who, do, who absolutely don't accept the Zionist notion that Israel is the home of the Jews. No, it's not. It's the home of the settlers who went there from, a lot of them are of the Jewish faith, but mm -hmm. what's important about Israel is the settlers. It's a, it's a colonization by people from northern Europe. They're not, they're not mm. from there. Yeah. They're from Russia and Poland and blah, blah. What's funny that you, you talked about uh, Zionism. When I was in Palestine, uh, people were very eager to talk to me. Just saw the camera. I'm just walking around uh, Ramallah and, and other places. And, well, come over here. I said, oh, you're just happy to have a conversation. I'm very blunt. I said, do, do you Palestinians hate Jews? And they said, no. Uh, we hate Zionist. And then I would go to another place out there and just be, you know, a totally different place, but I just said, well, do you hate what was, I mean, we hear the, the hatred and, um, no, we don't, we don't hate Jews at all. We, we hate Zionist. Uh, you know, this is what's happening. And, and, and I, I interviewed a long time ago, Judea Pearl was talking about, you know, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism and, uh, you know, all that stuff. And I went to, uh, to interview, um, Neve Gordon in London a little while ago. I tried to have an interview with him years ago and just couldn't do it with his university, watching everything he did. But, but said, you know, I think anti-Semitism is real um, and, and I think it's growing. But this conflation of legitimate criticism w with the policies of Israel is anti-Semitism. And, and you know, smearing people and saying you're you're an anti-Semite because you dare speak out against the the policies, and and you can actually cite the evidence. It isn't like, well, this is a violation of internet. I, I did interview Richard Falk in Santa Barbara, yeah. and and I took him through the you know as as a lawyer and you know all of these different things. What what are the violations? Like you you point out these violations, right? I've heard people do this to you. Uh, Roger, why is it that you only focus on Israel? Why not? Why not Syria? Why not? You know, Saudi Arabia. Why not all these these other places out there to try to you know kind of trap you? 
I wanted to ask you, there was a little segue earlier that uh, when you when you talked about doing the show in Mexico City, mm. and um, I, I'm very interested, I mean, I find, I was telling Jim about that, that video, I've shown it in British history, I teach British history and I show that, I, I find, I'm trying to search for the words a, about it, it's just so heavy and and it's so so deep and it, though i i loathe trump and the way you know trump is you know depicted in pendejo at you know, at the end can you talk a little bit about the creativity like the, the kind of evolution of, of the wall i mean obviously that was a, a long time ago your shows are obviously more political than, than than in the in the very beginning how do you plan for for those kinds of shows well you, you're talking about the wall, or you were, or or anything, or or well, I'm, or how about the pigs, the, three different pigs, ones three and, different ones, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, pigs, three different ones comes out of comes from Paul Tollett coming to me one day and saying um, it was great when you played Coachella, but I'm not sure you can do it again because blah blah blah, young people, da 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 da. But I've had this idea to do a Coachella in the autumn and it would be a sort of celebration of that bit of when music was happening in the late 60s and in the 70s and the mm -hmm. whatever. So I want to do a weekend just with six acts, you know, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, three headliners and three support acts. And, and I went, yeah, go on. He said, well, obviously it's Pink Floyd, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Well. Um, the Rolling Stones are sort of vaguely a band still, so and um, we can get them. Paul McCartney will do because the Beatles are all dead, you know, except for him, really, and Ringo obviously. But so Paul and you can be Pink Floyd, and I went, all right, I can do that. And what about the sport acts? He said, well, I was thinking Bob Dylan, Neil Young, and the Who. <laughs> and I thought, what a weird idea, but cool. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it finally happened, and so I had to put a show together, and and um, I got to choose. And I, I realised that I was being given the Pink Floyd mantle, and it was quite an opportunity. So I had did to you, play did, Pink I mean, Floyd. Did you songs. enjoy being the the single person that represents Pink Floyd? Was that a well, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I make, I make no bones about it. When when this film that we've just made us and them premiered in Venice. The Occupation of the American Mind or? No, no, okay. no. Yeah. Us and Them, my, my oh, okay. show film. Yeah. Just now, last week. Variety ran a, a review of it and it was a really great review. But the thing that really pleased me about it was that it connected the dots between Dark Side of the Moon, The Wall, and Muse to Death and Is This the Life We Really Want? Mm -hmm. And that really pleases me. Mm -hmm because um, that, is, that is a mantle that I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. You know, I was responsible for, for all those records. <coughs> and, and the fact that they're connected, so really, the, when I left Pink Floyd, I left the name behind, but I didn't leave the work behind. I've continued to do my work, such as it is, as well as I can mm -hmm. since then, and will continue to. And that was 85, correct? 85, yeah. yeah, so it's a long time ago. Yeah. <clears throat> but I've, you know, I've made four or five albums since then. And, yeah, and you, you mentioned, I, I saw that, that you think Amused to Death is, is, is a record that didn't get a fair hearing and, and you thought that uh, it was equal, maybe even surpassed Dark Side of the Moon, um, Wish You Were Here, is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, no, I wouldn't say, I don't, I, you can't really look at it like, like that. But it, it showed the um, enormous power of the trade, you know, of the trademark. When you use the P word and the F word together and stick it on something, mm -hmm. people buy it. Mm -hmm. they, do, they will. Whatever it's like, doesn't matter what it's like, as, as it turns out. Um, yeah, and, and so Amused to Death was a really important part of my journey into how committed I was to what I think about things. So, I mean, if you think about, if you 
if you go back and listen to Amused to Death now, the, the songs about the bombing of Libya and things, for instance, that, you know, Late Home Tonight, it, uh, the way it connects the farmer's wife to the woman in Tripoli, you know, mm -hmm. dying in her apartment while her husband's out mixing politics and rhythm in the mm -hmm. street outside. It's, um, I'm really proud to have documented that in song, mm -hmm. to have been that troubadour going from village to village telling the story yeah. that is not a story that people want told. Roger, I really love your music, but I hate your fucking politics. Um, <laughs> exactly. I, I love when you respond to that, which is not my response, but I just wanted to, to see that you had a, a, a little <coughs> chuckle. That, what, what do you say to the, the people that say that? Um, well, I, ma I made a demo of a new piece, that, and I haven't made the new piece of this radio play, and, and in it there's a part at the end of it um, where I say, if you're one of those, if you're one of those people, you might be well advised to fuck off to the bar right now. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. I mean, it's just so dumb. It's so dumb, but a lot, lot of people are very dumb. Yeah. yeah. I have, um, very interesting, 1982, I went to the, I went to the Republic of Ireland. I was just finishing up at Ox Oxford, Exeter College, Oxford. And it's just weird how life takes you on. I've been in Belfast about five times now filming uh, women peace builders. Right. I mean, the, the, the shakers and movers and Eamon McCann and Eamon Malach and, you know, some of the, these other people. And I've just been very fascinated. I think you, you wrote something, I, I believe, about a, a grandfather in, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And w what was that? What's that story about? Well, it, it's... Um it's a it's a whole record that I that, that I wrote, but I wrote it as a radio play. So it starts off with this old bloke sitting. He's watching TV and he's got a dog, which is whining, and he's watching Dirty Wars. He's watching the Scahill movie on on TV, and he and he it starts with a monologue. It is the year of some fuckers, Lord 2013, and it goes on and ra ranting on and on about this and that, and um, and uh, some of some of the stinking man. He's really cynical and bitter, and what, but his flow of invected is interrupted when you hear a kid crying, and he goes, "Dear God, it's the kid. The daughter will kill me," and you suddenly realise that he's babysitting. Mm -hmm. And he gets up and he goes into the other room and his grandson has woken up and is having a nightmare. And so he says, what, what, what is it? And the kid says, Grandpa, they're killing the children. And he said, no, 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 that was in the troubles, that was 30 years ago, they're not killing the children. No, he said, no, Grandpa, not here, over there. Mm. And the grandfather says, hey, you, you, you go back to sleep now, we'll, we'll find out, we'll go and find out, shall we, you and me. Would you like me to read you a bit of Winnie the Pooh? And it goes back to, you know, my favourite bit that I put on records whenever I can. Eeyore, the old grey donkey, sat by the side of the stream and looked as this reflection in the river and blah. Anyway, the rest of the record is a sort of magic carpet ride. Of the very next morning, the grandfather wakes the kid up and says, well, right, we're off. And they go to the moral high ground first to look for answers to this question, why are they killing the children? The children. And that's what the record is about. And they never find the answer mm -hmm. to that. Though there is a character in, in the story who's a Croatian taxi driver who they meet at some point. And he, he actually has his own answer for why they're killing the children because the very last lyric, and it's somewhat weird to tell you this now, sitting as we are in this beautiful place, but um, the end of the thing is the champion sits on his golden throne in his echoing, empty, magnificent home, looking out over the field of bones but the last man standing stands alone. And so is that the taxi driver at the end comes back and he says to him, and he says to the grandfather, 
they are killing the children for empty, echoing, magnificent home. Which is, you know, an interesting encapsulation of the whole idea of things being more important than feelings or people or... Yeah. Um, anyway, that, yeah. that's... I wanted to kind of ask in a, in a question, <coughs> a lot of times I do very long, I interview Chomsky for an hour and a half or some of these people an hour, then I, I spend a long time going through it and Jim edit it, edits it, and we, we go through and say we're trying to, we're trying to get that, that core piece. and. I've been kind of plagued by the, this idea of, of change. Jim kind of notices, Jim is very quiet. I do all the interviews and Jim listens. He says, you know, we don't really see too much of the talk of solution. And one of the things that bothers me, I remember you saying this too, that you love Jewish children and you love Palestinian children. It seems to me we're always playing a zero sum game. It's like my, my goal is not to expose what goes on in Israel for some negative reason. I think that people need to, to wake up. Um, I think that the occupation obviously is not good for Israelis too. Obviously it's, it, it's worse for Palestinians, but it isn't good for them. But trying to figure a way that by telling the story uh, that, that change can take place. It can be a catalyst for saying whether it's in Gaza or it's in the West Bank. I asked my students once teaching global studies, I said, I just want, you're on Freud's couch now. I'm saying one word and you tell me what. So I said Palestinian when I was just a terrorist. And I, I said, you made, nobody can make a bone about that. They said, Israeli, terrorist. It would be, oh my God, what was the professor? Jews are, are terrorists, or this is, is, is what happens. So, as you know, films are little clips, and you get this one magic, you know, kind of moment or something like that where someone expresses it. What, what, what do you think people should know about the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a catalyst for change? I, th I think people should should s see it as a model, see how unhappy everyone is, and and see how um, settler colonialism and and supremacist notions of supremacy of one group over another group brings no joy to anyone. It's only in our recognition that we're all Homo sapiens and that we're all brothers and sisters, and that we're all African, as far as we know, all the paleontological mm -hmm. evidence points to the fact that Homo sapiens came out of probably mainly North Africa, mm -hmm. probably less than 200,000 years ago, yeah. and spread over the globe, but the, there's no evidence to support the view that we're not all African. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, I've said this often in conversations with people, is what brings joy to our lives? Well, we know what it is. It, what brings joy to our lives is when we help a brother or sister. You know, what brings joy is, you know, just to go back to the Bible, which I rarely do, but the parable of the Good Samaritan is, is a good story and, and, and important. When you cross over to the other side, to help somebody, it brings joy to your life. Mm -hmm. And joy is the most, you know, it's, it's, it's the only thing that you can really grasp, and we all know it, how it feels, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Well, and you don't get it by stealing from people. Yeah. yeah. I was on the plane yesterday, and um, I got your, your email, and I got choked up. And I, I guess I've been just for the longest uh, time getting all the information, you know, from London. I thought, holy shit, this is, you know, this is like Rogers, you know, written this thing. And I, I told my, my family, they, they always think of me as Mr. Bean. Like, I, I dance through Mexico. I'm fucking around. You know, it's like I'm on camera and all this shit. I said, Dan, don't, don't get shot in Mexico. Don't do your, your crazy thing. I said, well, I just, just got the, this message. And it, I, I think after having all the messages from Kate, <laughs> for two years. It's like, it, Kate, you know, I mean, everything is kind of like the, the filter. And, and then all of a sudden I, I got this. I mean, it, it totally, it, it moved me. Um, and, you know, I was like, well, this is, I told you, I just, just got this message. It's, it's incredibly, you know, powerful for me. And uh, I know a lot of times you express, you don't really, like all the, all the, you know, the fanfare, but it's, as, a, as somebody who's years of age, I mean, 
that that to me was such a huge Pink Floyd was such a, a huge part. I, I have a, a a couple other you know questions that I want to get to, and I figured right, this is probably the last time I um, I get to talk to you like this, unless we're we're at the board or at the concert or or, or something like that. But one of the things I really like doing, I, I looked at all the, the pictures of you when you were young mm -hmm. and the pictures of Sid Barrett, and I always wondered, are you, are you a troubled soul? Is, is, do you think that's uh, uh, apt? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think so. Well, I, what I meant by that, if it was a qualify, I mean, <clears throat> incredibly deep on, on levels that perhaps other, other people don't. Um, I, I remember with interviewing Chomsky, I was quite afraid, first of all, just because of his knowledge, but I heard that he, you know, dismissed people and everything. I, I interviewed him three times and I never had anything, but I was, was wondering what the, you know, what, what the conversation would, would be with you and trying to pull out, uh, you know, things from you. I, I guess I like your energy and um, your tongue in cheek. I think you were talking about that you just like to a little satire with Donald Trump and, you know, some of your shows, and I'm like, yeah, wink, wink, nod, nod, you, 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 you like to do that. But I guess what I mean is the, the, the deepness of the stuff and your, your expressions and, and the stuff that comes out in your, you know, in the wall, you know, for, for example. I, I don't know how, I mean, somebody can produce something that, that fantastic. I mean, there's just so many different uh, layers, the anger, the, the shouting, the, you know, the power uh, mm. that, that you have in it. And as I said, you know, maybe I'd be quite happy to, I mean, you become a history teacher because you want the quiet life, you know, I'd, just, I'd be quite happy kind of kicking back here and, and doing this stuff. And what, what gets you up in the morning? Where, where, where do you continue to draw that passion? Well, you know, I'm lucky. I have a job where the work is its own reward. Really, mm -hmm. um, it's it's it's, very, it's really satisfying to occasionally, you know, get up in the morning and go and do something. Mm -hmm. um, the wall is was interesting because um, it was an insight that came from discomfort, the discomfort of doing shows in stadiums. Um, and the specific story was Montreal, the Olympic Stadium in 1977 on the Animals Tour, I think, and feeling so alienated from these people who were Pink Floyd fans and had no fucking idea what any of it was about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they were there getting drunk, having a good time, but rah, rah, rah. They were felt to me, standing on stage, as if they were 95%. I love your music, but I hate your politics. Damn, that's who they, they, they were. And so when I drew on my scrap of paper a picture of the wall being built across the front of the stage, just an expression of my lack of connection with the people who were supposed to be uh, in this communion. Um, I, I, I immediately thought, fuck me, what, what a great idea. And the rest of it just came from that. Mm -hmm. Well, hang on, if it's a wall, it would have been made of bricks probably. And each brick might represent something. And, blah, and I started to Another tick brick and tick and tick. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. What, what do you say about... I saw, but I don't oh, know, I should go there. Okay, but uh, with, with Donald Trump and, you know, yeah. we'll build that wall, I mean, First thing people are always saying, "Oh my God, let's just talk to Roger Waters." I mean, like, I, I think you're synonymous with like a wall. It's like Donald Trump is going to build this wall, going to Mexico pay for it. He's diverting money. What What do you say about this whole concept well, that we need a wall? He's, obviously, Trump is a buffoon, and and so he he's really important because the idea that the cheapest sort of clown in the world can become the president of the United States and he's mm -hmm. the finger on the nuclear button. Mm -hmm. It's really, really terrifying and it shows how easy it is to persuade um, an ill-educated population to follow a cheap demagogue like that, that he can get away with. The worse he behaves and the more outlandish and ridiculous his policies are, um, I mean, he, he, you know, he's, he's destroyed all the 
agencies that he possibly could in government. There's no longer any lawyers of worth their salt in the Department of Justice. Yeah. There are no diplomats um, in the State Department. He's totally dismantled the in Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, putting Greg Pruitt in as the... He's, he's sort of gone out of his way to Betsy destroy DeVos. the United States of America and, in consequence, the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. He's just he's gone absolutely... And yet, he'll probably get elected for, for a second term. Mm -hmm. Do you think he will be elected? I have no idea. I have no yeah. idea. I yeah. mean, I, I never watch any... I don't watch TV except for soccer and cricket. I, uh, and if I, if I want any news, I go to RT or Al Jazeera to, if there's something going on somewhere else in the world and I want to find out what it might be. Because mm -hmm. you can't get anything from any US mainstream media. Mm -hmm. It's all just propaganda, it's all just selling the same narrative over and over again, so, um, yeah, Trump, you know, tr and I have no doubt that Donald Trump thinks he's great, I'm sure he does, I'm sure he really does, he, a fr I had a friend who used to tell me about the early days when Trump was young and he'd just been given the first five million bucks by his father to start a business or whatever, and uh, it, he loved to make a splash. Studio 54, club, clubs in New York. And this friend of mine told me, strangely enough, his name's Finkelstein as well. It's not Alan, Norman, though. Not Norman, no. Yeah. Not Norman. Alan. He, and he said that you'd be sitting in the club or something, and Trump would come in with a few acolytes, and there'd be a sort of murmur go around the place. If that, and Trump thought, the, the murmur was there going, hey, there's Donald Trump, isn't he great, you know? And all the women are ogling him and wanting to, you know, mm. fuck him or whatever, 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 whatever. And in fact, my friend said to me, is the huge murmur that went round the club whenever Trump appeared would be, there's that prick Trump, what a loathsome blah, blah, piece of shit he is. And, uh, and all the women are going, uh, can you imagine him laying a finger on you? How disgusting. Mm -hmm. And so this is what it was. But Trump was thinking, they're going, look how cool he is. And he's still like that, I yeah. think. He's he, he lives in a fantasy world where he's cool. Uh, I mean, it, He it, could be forgiven for it because he was voted for by millions and millions of people. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's very, very sad, as you say, like an environmental protection agency. You think that someone that was hired for the job would understand what the mission statement is of environmental protection, not to destroy everything is out there, or yeah. we don't want anybody <coughs> watching the, the banks anymore. If, if oil uh, erupts on Native American land, that's okay. It's about this instant fix, or we, we don't really believe in climate change, or the whole world's going to, you know, to hell in a handbasket, but we can we're make do, the... We're doing all right. Yeah, so, you know. Before you go, I I'll, I'll, I'll wrote a new song which is about this. I could play it, play it to you before oh, we go. Oh dear, yeah. Can't, but I don't want it filmed or recorded, but if you want to hear it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. It's a uh, song about Standing Rock. Uh, yeah, it's in, interesting, just interesting stuff, you know, going on in the world. And then it, it's weird as a, as a historian, it, it, it's like watching all the stuff, like the violation of the emoluments clause. And, and how much profiteering has taken place. And I always think about that, that story, like the Buddhist story of the, the frog, when you throw it into the boiling hot water and it'll jump the first time. Um, but then it gets used to the, the water. And it's like, I think Trump has done so many crazy things that w this is the new norm that he doesn't shock people by any of the things that he does anymore. And the apathy starts to set in and we, we just kind of fall asleep at the wheel while more and more stuff, well, I've diverted thri three billion from the, the military, that's going for the, the building. Is anybody gonna say anything about this? We'll see what happens here. Or, you know, I've sacked this particular person or I just made million dollars in Russia and, uh, you know, something else like that. And we're just, just watching, all, you know, all, all this stuff take place. I'm, I'm improvising now, I'm thinking a couple of things, but it seems to me on, on Facebook and other places, it seems like I see a lot of um, work going on, on Pink Floyd, like uh, albums, uh, re, I don't know, re-editing, uh, re, you know, going through, or is there new stuff coming out, redone stuff on, on Pink Floyd albums taking place? 
you know, that that people are constantly trying to resell the same thing over and over and over again, mm -hmm. which I disapprove of mm -hmm. heartily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny. The Pink Floyd words are, I'm, I'm have no access. There is a Pink Floyd website, but I have no access to it. Because mm -hmm. David controls it. So. Um, and what was the purpose of the controlling of it? You'd have to ask him that. I mean, I might have theories. Yeah. Well, I don't um, know if I could feel bold enough. It's just. I don't know if I can even make a connection. I sometimes get people tell me what a great history teacher I am, and I find it very difficult to kind of digest this, so I kind of know really what, what to say. I mean, I'm, I'm honored that they, they say that. And sometimes I kind of wonder that, when I think of, of Pink Floyd is kind of a marriage where the whole thing was so uh, absolutely freaking amazing that it, that it blew people's minds and and it was like the, the togetherness without maybe understanding all the all the the details you know like you writing most of the material or somebody contributing this way or something goes like that and uh, you know I, I guess i hate all breakups and divorces and and when when things i mean i think it's so unique that anybody could come together and and be spectacular i, I remember queen talking about getting in very bitter discussions but it was always for the well-being of the the album, you know, that they could go out there and say, I don't like this shit, or this isn't good, or this isn't, because in, in the end, it was about the artistic, you know, kind of work. And it's like somebody coming up to me and said, man, you, the, the stuff is, it, you know, it's just absolutely uh, amazing. I mean, even, it, I know this is not new that someone says Pink Floyd is amazing, or this is, but just... I mean, it, it, it's so unique with all the different chemistry. I do, you do a lot of cooking, correct? Uh, yeah, quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do a Thai seafood soup, and I make it from scratch, and my kids really love it. What I really like about it is that I'm boiling hot water, that's all there's in there. So go have a taste. Well, Dad, it's hot water. And then there's a little chicken broth in it. Well, I could taste a little chicken broth in there. And, and then after that, um, you have lemongrass. Now it's got this little consistency, and then there's red curry. And in the end, it's just this wonderful thing and I don't know that I necessarily need to dissect it. It collectively, it's just it's fantastic. You know, I can taste the coconut milk, and I can taste this, and that's kind of the way I feel like when when people are just so fantastic in the productions of of, of all that that kind of stuff. And then you know, it's to me, anyway, it's a sad. <coughs> Do you have any contact with David at all? Um, yeah, very little. We 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 actually had a meeting a few months ago to try and figure out how to proceed uh-huh but nothing came of it unfortunately nothing came of it yeah well no yeah nothing came of it well is meeting together something that, that that's positive about that I mean I, they, they I don't get know together. it's it's you know life is short yeah and um, so I'm I hoping that I use my time more profitably than that. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's, I mean, I didn't leave Pink Floyd in 1985 for no reason. Mm -hmm. I left because it was completely impossible to continue. Mm -hmm. So, so I left. But yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got some marriages behind me that I left as well, using the divorce analogy. Mm hmm. Uh, or was left or whatever, but they finished anyway, and, right. I'm, and I'm glad they did. Uh huh. It, it was a good thing, and I'm really glad that the Pink Floyd divorce happened. Uh huh. It's this, you know, some bad blood left and whatever, but so what? You know, I mean, it, there's nothing you can do about it. You you can't heal bad blood. You can't change people. They people are who they are, and they do what they want to do. <clears throat> so, yeah. you can't you can't change people. Mm. Jim and I were talking on the way over, like Dark Side of the Moon. We do a lot of talking. We're in the car all the time, but it was Dark Side of the Moon, and, and listening to all your early um, music. You know, watching P 
Pink Floyd documentaries, and I think the documentary was one like, you guys were not really visible. You'd be playing on the stage, you know, for many, many minutes, rambling on, but kind of like the mist was there and the clouds there, and it wasn't like, you know, you were in there. And then somehow, you had Dark Side of the Moon, and I think in some ways, it, for me, I, I can't see how you got there. Mm -hmm. What I mean, it it wasn't like there was a, this, I was like, well, this is that. It, w it was, you know, some of the music seemed to me rambling. It would go on for a long time. It was, yeah. you know, very artsy. And then all of a sudden, it's like, Jesus, how, how, how did they get from that to, to Dark Side of the Moon? And I remember you talking about a little bit how you had mastered your, you know, the, the craft and you were proud uh, collectively the, of what people had, had put in into that yeah so uh, well i can see how we got there yeah yeah absolutely i mean a huge stepping stone was a philosophical stepping stone is in um two strangers passing in the street by chance two passing glances meet and i am you and what i see is me that's a big that is a big moment of Oh look, here's a path. Here's a path. This is our humanity. This is our shared humanity. This is this is being human and being capable of empathy and being capable of looking into the stranger's eyes and understanding that we're the sa that we're brothers. Um, that that's in in the writing of the songs. That is a big moment, and it leads on to. Oh, I've got a good idea for a record. Let's let's make a record where every track that is on it is about something that affects us fundamentally, and not just us, everybody. You know, so we can make a thing that is about death and religion, you know, and love and blah and blah. But it's a very um, sketchy notion and money. And, blah, blah. and so that's where all the songs came from, come from that basic, mm. very, very simple idea. And that's then the craft of all, all of us as musicians putting the thing together did create something that was kind of magical. And as I've often said in the past, that was sort of the culmination of the work, really, that we did together. Although we then made Wish You Were Here and, and Animals and and the wall and the final cut so there were four, four more albums after that mm -hmm. but it was all it was after dark side of the moon it was well dark side of the moon was the first one that i t i t i meant it i it was in my hands to do it and that's what became more and more and more uncomfortable as we went on making records was they became more and more and more mine not a collective thing just because mm -hmm. we all develop in different ways and we work in different ways and, mm -hmm. and we are and, and and also because everybody is not a writer you know mm -hmm. this, no absolutely this not one <laughs> thing I, I put that in the question to you but I guess um, I've seen you when you were I, I love maybe just being the historian you know my wife is English as I told you but I always kind of look at people that are 14 or 15 16 they have their whole life ahead of them. They're, they're getting into a band, and and one of the things that's interesting. I'm just wondering if you had like a, a pleasant story. Were you originally born in Surrey, if I remember? Yeah. And then it was Cambridge, right? right. Was, okay. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, a happy story. And then the, the other thing that that kind of hit me also is that I suspect, I, I know, but um, when, when Sid was no longer in, in the band, you, your life in the band changes dramatically. You know, for, I mean, you were the writer, and and you were, I mean, probably came out of your, you know, where, where you had been before. But what was it like with you and 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 Sid as as youngsters, teenagers, really? Well, we, we, you know, we lived, we dreamt the dream, and then we lived it for a bit. Uh huh. But so we we collectively um, dreamt the dream. I, 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 this is in my memoir, I've been writing a memoir, in bit, but the, we went to see a pop concert at the Gaumont State in Kilburn. And uh, it was, I can't remember who was the headliner, 
but Rolling Stones were on it and who else was on it? Mickey Most was an artist in those days. <laughs> he was a singer. Helen Shapiro, um, Eddie Cochran. It was a real, it was a proper like package tour. But anyway, the only reason I bring it up is that going home to Cambridge afterwards, we had pa paper and pencil, we started drawing the band and what we would have. And we'd figured, Sid and I had it completely figured out. We needed two Vox AC30s, one for the vocals and the bass and the this and that, and one for the keyboards and the guitars and whatever. So I remember sitting there doing the, and doing these drawings with him. Um, and, we, and we made an agreement then, we must have been 16, I guess, at the time, that when we were both at college in London, we would start a band together. Well, I already had a band when he arrived because he came up a year or two years after me and moved into the apartment that I shared with with uh, Rick and Nick. And uh, that was sort of the start of it. And of course he was, you know, full of ideas and deeply attached to the West Coast experimental st stuff that was going on with Love and other bands. And the rest is history. Yeah. How, how did your life change in, in, in the band? I mean, a, after Sid was gone and David had joined the, the band, what kind of responsibilities that you taken on? I mean, I think you were probably redirected in life. Yeah. Well, you know, it's sink or swim. You cannot, a, a band cannot survive. Well, it depends. It, maybe it can. I don't know. I mean, David might have a different opinion about this, but my view is that a band can only survive if somebody is writing. Mm. You know, if if it, if if the work has is is going to have any kind of meaning at all, really, if it is, clearly a lot of popular music is entirely vacuous and and becomes popular because it's not about anything. It's just la di da di da di da. And, uh, and and that's fine. That's, that's fine. That some people do that. But I don't know why I've always wanted. I've always felt a need to express my innermost feelings through writing. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I could write. None. I write quite a lot of prose now because, as I say, I'm writing a memoir, and I've discovered that I can write prose, mm -hmm. which is f fascinating to discover that. So I can write a short story by getting a piece of paper and starting at the beginning and just writing it and writing it. And I can write something that's coherent and, you know, a couple of thousand words long. It's weird. Yeah. Particularly as my teachers at school, particularly one, G.W. Mantell, told me I was useless and that I would never amount to anything ever. And, and that I was particularly English. Yeah. It's because I had untidy handwriting, mm. I think. But how, how, if you're a teacher, how weird to be that wrong? Right. <laughs> Do you think your dad would be proud of you? Well, um, yeah. Why? Um, well, I could say... I could, um, in fact I will, I'll go and get my computer in a minute. I'll read you a poem called The Child Left Behind, which is about that specifically. Um, okay. I'll get it now. Yeah, don't forget. I won't, I'll put this in my pocket. I'll be back in one second. Sure. This isn't it, but I'm going to read this out. I'm going to read this poem tomorrow afternoon when I'm at Harold Square. There's about 20 people and we, they've said, keep it under three minutes when you do. So this is something I wrote in 2004, just before G.W. Bush's second term. It's called, Why Cannot the Good Prevail? And I'm, I think I'm going to read it tomorrow. Why cannot the good prevail? Here in America, 
There is at heart a people just and true, open sometimes to the point of ridicule. Good neighbours to rebuild the barn, the doctor's note of western legend carried forth beyond the grave. I knew your pa enough. In caucuses across the land, deliberate they'll always stand, defenders of the Rosenbergs, symbolic of that inner yearning to be better than before. They never will give up their brother to the grocer's cold machine, belt welts livid from the strong arm of the law. On campuses, in boardrooms, over giving thanks and pumpkin pie, on hustings in committee rooms, whenever tyrants loomed, we always held in our esteem the ones who hold on to the dream, unflinching while the bullies pose and fiddle on the hill. Has commerce so reduced the free that, blinded like a tot contaminated by the dog shit in the grass, we blunder, slaves to humbug and this Texan dynasty? No. Beyond the grip of trade, the young strain beautiful and proud, the hoarfrost breath of new blood needs but nudges from the old forgotten guard to scale the moral high grounds in the clouds. Jesus. That's one. Um, okay, but this is the child left behind that. So, where is that? So this, I, I'll explain, this is actually, I started writing this poem, Having Had a Dream. And it was just after I met my third wife, I think. Here we go. <clears throat> the child left behind. In dreams I drove abandoned, reckless left the dead Mercedes on the pile, content to later pay the price of youth the child left behind. I walked with mother in the garden. The fat boy swung his thin cane at the fence. She claimed his talent lay beyond my ken and, irritated that I could not understand, I disengaged myself from mother's arm and fled up narrow back stairs to my room. With tiger strides you followed me, determined then to make a stand, but through hot tears I would not turn, enjoyed the moment of pursuit, testing like a child to see if you would really stay with me. Waking then, you left the room for water and to snuff the candles out, and half asleep, I feared the worst. I could not move, I could not shout. At six o'clock I woke again, you stirred, your hand lay in my groin, I turned first this way and then that, you, sleeping, followed every move, you stuck like sunshine to a cat. And blue skies burst into the dawn, and linnets sang, and skylarks soared, and like a hatching lapwing chick, I blinked and wondered at the scale of it and smelled the sheep and flung my body through the waterfall where salmon rush in search of spawning grounds and thrashed in the crushed clover of new love, bold, naked, stained, content, tan, strong, alive and spent. And raised upon one elbow then across the meadow and the fen, I saw a boy in khaki shorts and tartan shirt who'd always thought that maybe if he did his best his dad would come home with the rest. And who, although he tried and tried, mother, for she had to work, not meaning though to be unkind, who mother often left behind. And that boy turned and caught my eye, and then across the field of time, I saw him flick his fringe and grin and recognize the man within, and raise his fist as if to say, we kept our faith, we stood our ground. We did our best, we kept his trust. Our dad would have been proud of us. Then turning to the river bank, he put more bread paste on his hook and felt the mud between his toes and fixed the shot and set the float and settled there to watch and wait and muse and try some different bait. And proudly from another time, I watched the child left behind. Yes, that's fucking amazing. That's fucking amazing. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to read you this now. It's just a bit of prose, all right? Sid and me and the Norton. It's cool. 
This must have been the year before I went up to the Poly in London. How do I know that? Because of the Norton. Ah, the Norton. Silver, clean, 350 sexy cc's of what today might be called teen spirit. A one-lung, single-cylinder to all you non-biker ignoramuses. A fucking dream on two wheels. Weirdly enough, all those years later in 1970-something, when Dave Gilmore first set eyes on Ginger, his future wife, at that roller rink in Ann Arbor, he said, there goes a dream on wheels. She was, as I recall, wearing white kid roller skating boots and a sort of red velvet Father Christmassy tutu with white fur trim. I digress. Where was I? Oh yeah, the Norton 350. Let me retrace my steps. The Norton was the last in a distinguished line of British motorcycles from my youth. First was a probably pre-war Francis Barnett, 125cc, that I owned in partnership with Willa. More of Willa later. After the Franny B, a couple of scramble bikes, mongrels of indeterminate lineage, and the Velocet. Velocet. Ah, black with gold piping and a dramatic fishtail exhaust pipe. I may have to furnish this memoir with black and white photographs so that it can sit content, mouldering alongside bound copies of the Badminton Gazette in the libraries of minor count, count country houses or in the bedsits of old drummers south of the river, fallen on hard times. <laughs> the drummers, that is, not the bedsits or the river. I lived in a bedsit for a short while. It was on the Cromwell Road, on the right, on the way to the airport, just before you get to the billboards and Earl's Court. I had a night or at least an afternoon or two in that bedsit during my brief affair with Heather Osborne. Not my first love, but my first, how to put this delicately, my very first fuck. Shiny black plastic mac and bouffant hair and great wit and confidence and unafraid makes me smile that quiet, gentle lip corners turning slightly up, eye crinkly remembering smile. More tea, sir? What? No, thank you. A little more wine, sir? Well, yes, just a drop. I have no idea how or where I met Heather, probably in Cambridge, because she was very Cambridge. Maybe a coffee bar. More of coffee bars later. When I went up to London, there was some discussion as to where I might live. My maternal grandfather, Lieutenant Colonel Robert White, DSOMC, had spent some time in London as a young man doing God knows what and God knows when, but he had resided in a hostel just off the Marylebone Road, rejoicing or not rejoicing, I suspect the latter, in the name of the Young Men's Caledonian Christian Club. My big brother John, two years my senior, went to London to study to become a chartered surveyor and spent two years in the Young Men's Caledonian Christian Club. So when I went up, as a matter of family tradition, I was willy-nilly booked in. It was four quid a week, including breakfast, and I had to share a room with a dowdy youth who, thank God, went off to work at some ungodly hour and was gone all day. I, on the other hand, was a student. I had a grant of 360 pounds a year. I was free. Heather was in London, don't remember why. So on the second day, making the most of the absence of the Doha youth, we ended up engaged in mid-afternoon rumpy pumpy, only if he discovered in flagrante by the club's Uriah Heap. Yeah, what's going on? Disgusting. Leave these premises immediately. Well, what Uriah didn't know was that Heather's father was a rear admiral of the fleet and at that time captain of the HMS Vanguard, a battleship of some renown mothballed in Portsmouth Harbour. And young Heather, not used to being berated by other ranks, gave him a dressing down, the like of which, well, if you deleted all the expletives, there'd be precious little left upon which the court might form an opinion. <laughs> I recall quite a lot of how dare you ing and disgust and little manning and get out, get out, get outing, delivered with much ample bosom heaving and imperious grandeur. I should look Heather up, really. She'd be about 40 now, give or take 20 years or so. I bet she's still beautiful, and I'll be bound still full of piss and vinegar and nectar in equal measure. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. It's actually about how Sid and I nearly killed ourselves on the Norton because we went on a race in the middle of the night. And when we got back to his mum's house, the front tar went oh. Lucky there. That would have been the end of Pink Floyd. Anyway. Yeah. I'll stop. Yeah. Goodbye.
Man, today was one of the most surreal days in, in my life. We're sitting on the beach right here in, in New York, but right over there is the Hamptons. And I, I just had an interview with Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame, an activist and, and writer. And uh, Roger was absolutely gracious with his time. Uh, he spoke to me for about two hours, almost two hours. He signed some t-shirts. He read a little poetry. He was playing the, the piano. It was just a great opportunity to ask Roger questions about anti-Semitism and about Israel and about Palestine, about Donald Trump, about the wall. Uh, Roger even got into questions about Pink Floyd and uh, dark side of the, the moon and relationships with, with band members. And uh, he read some poetry about Sid Barrett and gave us some very, very nice stories of, of early days in England when they were about 15 and 16 years of age. So it's a little difficult for me to calm down after such a surreal day, but just an absolutely gorgeous day here in, in New York. Uh, I think it's about uh, 80 degrees, close to 80 degrees. We're sitting out on the public beach here. And again, over in the horizon, those are all the wealthy people that are out in the Hamptons.